good morning. Turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to continue on in our series on uprooting rejection. And uh, because it's a wedding today, we're going to look at rejection and marriage, which is fitting. Maybe our couple can listen to this later on and be helpful to them. 2 Samuel 6, we're looking very quickly, uh, introduction, the principle of rejection when people uh, receive disapproval or they do not receive value or worth, we're looking at that producing unhealthy roots. And so many emotions, actions, decisions are rooted in rejection. We are believing that the power of truth and a supernatural deliverance is going to make a difference. So today we're going to look at how rejection works out in marriage. And we see this um, in uh, the story of David and his wife, McCall. If you're reading the scripture, please don't call her Michael. I know that would be very modern and hip, David and Michael, but it's, it's McCall, okay? 2 Samuel 6, we're going to read verse 16 and verse 20 through 23, our main verse, then we'll get into it. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Verse, go ahead, 20 through 23. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David, and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly <coughs> uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, have no children to the day of her death. Okay, rejection in marriage. Let's begin. Let's talk about rejection baggage. So we have to get a quick background. We're parachuting into the middle of a story. If you don't know uh, who this was, Michal was the daughter of King Saul. And she had a life, if you look at it, filled with rejection. Michal, our first uh, introduction to her. She was used by her father. He saw no value in her except as a tool to use for his own purposes. He offers her kind of as a door prize. He's, he's hating David, wants him to be destroyed, but kind of, I'll, I'll give you my daughter if you kill a bunch of uh, Philistines in, in that. So, but in doing that, he actually is speaking about how little value he placed upon her. Then her own father rejects her because she chooses to help her husband. And then he winds up uh, giving her away to another man to punish David. And then at the time that we're reading here, she is forced to compete. David had a lot of love, apparently. He married six other women. And so she is now forced to compete for David's attention. And obviously this would not produce healthy things as you see in the Bible, anytime you read about polygamy, it's not a good thing. It's always a disaster. So this woman is coming into our story with a background of rejection. You do not have worth or value. So in the story we read, David and McCall, they're married. Here's the point we're looking at today. We bring rejection issues into our marriage. If you don't deal with rejection before you get married, I promise you when you get married, part of the baggage when you moved in was rejection baggage. Okay, so rejection is an opinion of value. And we've looked at this in number of, numbers of ways. Someone in your life gave you the opinion that you have no value or that you have less value. That is the message that McCall has gotten from her father from her husband even in some ways in the decisions uh, that are being made. You have no worth or you're not worth as much as uh, uh, others. And so this produces something. I want you to see this. Rejection is a viewpoint. We've been looking at this in different ways. Rejection is a set of glasses that you look at life one of the things that rejection does is it forms your opinion of the opposite sex. Okay? Men get their opinion of women, and it is formed in unhealthy ways by rejection. Women get their opinion of men in unhealthy ways from 
rejection. 2 Samuel 6, 16. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. Okay, she despised. This is a viewpoint. This, of course, is her husband, and he no doubt has done things to take her off. But it's, it's bigger than that. This is her opinion of men. There are ladies that are here. You were told by a woman in your life, all men are pigs, right? Out of their rejection, their bitterness, they put that in you. That's what men are like. There are men that are here. You had men tell you in your life, never trust a woman. Women are no good. So now, at some point, people fall in love. They get married. But the problem is they bring baggage from the past in this. So look at a number of ways that this works out in marriage. So some people, it works like this. They have a spirit of fear put into them concerning marriage. Why do they have fear? Because they watch their parents' dysfunctional marriage. Growing up, they saw how their mother and father fought. They saw how maybe even at times they even turned this on. The only reason why we got married is because I got pregnant. And then they, they see this intense, I'm leaving you. So now what happens is someone is going to at some point fall in love. David and McCall fell in love at some point. But the problem is when you have fear, what fear does is you put up walls. For some people, that is, I will never get married. That, that's it. Why are you 95 and have not gotten married? It's not because there haven't been chances in some cases. It's because there is no way I will ever put myself in the position like I saw my mother or my father. Mm -mm. So you have now let someone else's opinion put barriers to happiness. Or for others, probably in David and McCall's case, what happened is they got married, but fear, this is very common, you put up walls of protection. I'm marrying you, but... I'm going to make sure you never make me feel like I saw my parents feel. I saw their anger. I saw their tears. You're not doing that to me. So, but the strange thing is we love each other. We'll get married, but we get married and we build walls of protection. So listen, if you go home today and you build a wall in the house in the middle of the bedroom, this is not going to help your marriage, Right? So there are people that they think that marriage is flawed, but it's not. It's just the walls that you have built up because you carry that fear of rejection into your marriage. The second thing, <clears throat> when you think about this, this is a little deeper, is that we view our spouse, again, rejection is glasses, we view our spouse through the lens of how we view ourselves. And that is a, a, a profound issue. So, God made you to have value. God made you to have worth. You are precious in God's eyes. He wants you to have a sense of worth and value. Let's, let's look at a, a scripture, Mark 12, 31. The second commandment is love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay, I'm not taking this to an extreme. This is not the self-esteem movement. You know, look yourself in the mirror. I am somebody. But God is saying something here. He does want, this is not in a weird way uh, where everyone's a winner and no one's a loser, all the strange things in the world. I get that. I get how pride is the root of sin. But God gave you worth. He does want you to have a sense of worth that comes from him. That's ultimately where we're headed in the series. Your worth comes from God. So if you don't, Love yourself, and I simply mean in that way, not a strange way. If you don't have a sense of your value in God, the problem is, if you don't think you have value and worth, one of the things that happens to people who don't have a sense of worth, they get married, and the thought that someone now suddenly loves them, you would think that that, that would be like the answer. Like, I don't have worth, I got married, she loves me, it's all fixed. Rainbows and butterflies, it's wonderful, music playing, in the, but that's not what happens. For some people, they actually cannot handle the fact that someone loves them more than they love themselves. I love you, but the question in the back of their mind is, why? 
why would you love someone like me? Because you got this message. You have no value. You are not loved. You have no worth. So, one of Part of the reason I'm doing this series is it may be that you are acting in unhealthy ways and you don't realize the root of it, right? The whole thing, uprooting rejection. My, I, I've told you in numbers of the lessons, my interest in rejection is because I have observed people, they are hurting themselves, and why would you do that? So think about this. Someone who comes in with a message that they have no value, now they get married, which is supposed to be whether that was only in the courtship or whether that's in ongoing in marriage, I love you more than anybody else in the world. For some people, that does not make them comfortable. So people who have unhealed rejection issues, sometimes they try to sabotage that relationship. This makes them uncomfortable. The easiest way to sabotage your relationship is pick a fight. There are some people, like they, is, why do you like fighting? Like all the time. Sometimes it has nothing to do with the bills or the trash or the kids. Sometimes it's how you feel about yourself, that message of rejection that you haven't fixed it. So if you pick a fight, let's, let's go back to uh, 2 Samuel 6, verse 20. When David returned home to bless his own family, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. Okay, and then we didn't, we didn't take time to read his response. The problem with, with couples fighting, they don't do so reasonably, right? It's not like a reasonable conversation of, you know what, I think maybe this was a little excessive. No, no, no. Here it is, I see you there. You were flashing the, the ladies. I knew you were. So what does he do? Does he go, you know, I think you're looking at this incorrectly. No, no, he goes, listen, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be worse than that. And all the ladies are going to love me and you're not. Because <laughs> that's how couples fight. So the problem when one couple has a rejection or one party has a rejection issue, they pick a fight. The result is that the person attacks them. Unfortunately, they probably don't do it reasonably. They start using names. You ugly, stupid witch. But the problem is, if that's what you feel about yourself in the first place. See, you tear it down until they get to the point that that's what you actually believe. And there are some people, they are only comfortable in an atmosphere of rejection. Love freaks them out. So, Think about this. You, you would think, this has been my puzzle through the years in working with people, people that have a bad experience, I would think, logic would say, I, I want nothing to do, I will never, ever, ever feel like that again. But some people, they recreate the rejection of the past. They sabotage their own relationships, and we're talking about marriage, until in their home they recreate the exact dysfunctional rejection that they experienced. That's not a healthy way to, uh, uh, to live. And so they push. What McCall's doing is she's attacking David until he pushes back and attacks her that then matches the rejection that she feels. And I appreciate this is probably deeper issues than some of you have thought about. So, but this is rejection. It's affecting your relationship. Our text shows us something else in marriage. Rejection twists communication. I often tell people when they're, they're, they're looking for a spouse, find somebody you can talk to. Right? I see people who are like, oh, she's beautiful. Her body. She might not look like that forever. Okay? Or, you know, oh, he's, he's so handsome. He's a pig. Right? You're not going to be happy with this. What you really want is somebody you can talk to because a whole lot of marriage is going to be communication. Okay, rejection, as we've said, is painful. So the problem is when you are hurting, you tend to speak from a place of hurt. The old, uh, you know, it sounds like a, a cliche or psychobabble, hurt people, hurt people. But that's really true. Is that when you are hurting from the inside, you don't speak in healthy ways. 2 Samuel 6, verse 20. Then David returned home to bless his own family. Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. 
she was disgusted. How distinguished, how dis, sorry, distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. Okay, I told you about Nicole's background. She's hurting. So what does she do? In communicating, she's not trying to express, I have a need. What she's doing is she is trying to hurt. This is denigrating. Yeah, you're just an old pervert. You're trying to flash the young girls. But, but she's saying that because she is hurting. So we speak from a place of hurt. That's, that's why it's very, it's very difficult to have a healthy marriage if you don't fix your rejection, rejection issues because you're never going to speak reasonably about issues to resolve. This is couples, they go into marriage, they think if we have a conflict, the point is I'm going to hurt you worse than you hurt me. I win. I bring up the past. I talk about your mother. I bring up every failure. I win. But that's often because we have hurt that we've not fixed it. You not only speak from a place of hurt, you hear from a place of hurt. We've looked at this in numbers of them. So rejection interprets. Rejection filters. And everything a person who is rejected, what they hear, it comes through rejection first. So now marriage becomes difficult. So a man will tell his wife, you are beautiful. Those are, those are good words to uh, uh, tell your wife. But the problem is, what she hears is that you don't really mean that. You just have to say that. No, I'm not. And, and often there's a difficulty. A foolish man, he will take that literal and go, fine, then I'll never say it again. Or, or man, as we've said often, when you interpret they can't speak about an issue. You failed to pay a bill. You have to take out the trash. The reaction of what they hear is often, so you think I'm stupid. So communication is twisted. You're speaking from hurt. You're hearing from hurt. Or there are people, this is especially destructive in marriage, is they fail to communicate because of hurt. You have a problem. You know, in our marriage, have you told them about it? No. <laughs> Why would you not, if this is important enough to you, if it's eating you up, why would you not tell the one you're supposed to love more than all the world? But some people have gotten this message, you don't talk about anything upsetting or painful, so you bring this into the relationship. It is very difficult to have a healthy relationship when you have rejection. Final thing is that, of course, rejection when people have hurt you and given you a message that you have no value, it produces bitterness. It's anger or resentment held on to. That's what bitterness literally means. Let's read Hebrews 12, 15. I'm uh, having it read from the New Living Translation. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Okay. A poisonous root of bitterness. Bitterness is violations held on to. Someone hurt you, someone rejected you, someone said something terrible to you, someone violated you, so what do you do? You hold on. I don't let that go. You keep it alive in your mind, you keep it alive with your mouth. But the Bible says it is a poisonous root under the surface. We've been looking at this image, that's the whole series, uprooting rejection. There can be things under the surface, but the Bible says it is troubling you, it is corrupting. It's ruining everything good. And so this is uh, uh, the problem. If you have bitterness toward past rejection, people who've rejected you, when you get married, you bring home baggage. But the problem is your baggage is full of poison. You set up in a new house, but with old bitterness. And so uh, I think we looked at this in, a, in another uh, issue. So... The corrupting influence, the Bible says, what does bitterness do? It troubles you, but then what does it do? It corrupts or damages or ruins or stains. These are other words that are used, other people. So now you get married. I love you, baby. But the problem is you have unhealed bitterness. You have rejection that you drag into the new relationship. And so what happens is now there's a sensitivity this is, this is what bitterness does. It's a sensitivity. You are on hyper alert. I often tell people, I, this is a poor analogy, but it's like sunburn. You ever notice that? Every time you get sunburned, that's when people want to pat, pat you on the back, right? 
Normally it wouldn't bother. Hey, how you doing? Great. But you got some, ah! That's what bitterness does, is you have the past, and so your spouse says some small thing, and you go, the Incredible Hulk comes out. You might not be fighting with them at all. You might still be fighting with, and this is often what people do, they actually say these words in conflict. Yeah, you're just like my dad. You're just like my ex-wife. Wait, I wasn't there. But we're bringing this in, so it makes it very difficult. David and McCall is not a story of a happy marriage, and rejection is the root of this. So let's move on. Let's talk about rejection damage. As I said, it's hard to have a good marriage. Rejection does damage. It affects your marriage. The first thing that rejection does damaging in marriage is it affects your viewpoint. You look at, in this case, the person you're supposed to love, but what you see is unhealthy. He comes home. This, this should be one of the greatest days in the nation of Israel's life. They bring back the ark, the present. It's all about God. God is back with us. Is she excited about God? Absolutely not. Does she see how many people are going to be helped by having the presence of God? Absolutely not. What does she see? You acted like a fool and you're like some pervert. That's what she, she manages to come to an unhealthy conclusion. Titus 1.15. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. The defiled and unbelieving. So, defiled is stained. If there is stain inside, if there's damage inside, unbelieving, that doesn't have to be about God. If you don't believe men are any good, women are any good, the problem is there's nothing good. Nothing is pure. You look at everything, you come to a wrong conclusion, the only thing that you can see is bad. So now you're married, married, you can't see anything good, you can't enjoy anything that the, your spouse is doing right, you can only see what's doing wrong. Often in marriage counseling, no doubt some of you here I've counseled your marriage, and I asked you a simple question. Tell me something good about your spouse. Tell me something good that your spouse does, your husband does, your wife does. And it's common, this is not... If you have done this, I'm not singling you out. This is very common. Often they'll be like, nothing. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Listen, so, I mean, not one thing in the entire world. Listen, if you can't see anything good, I predict, I don't have to be a prophet to say this, you're not going to stay married. Or you're going to be miserable till you die. Because that's, that's, that's not correct. Like, come on. There was something good about them when you married them. But the problem is rejection and bitterness. Now all we see is, let me tell you 4,000 things you're doing wrong. A healthy marriage isn't denying that there's problems, but you have to be able to see. So it kills your viewpoint. Rejection, secondly, it kills love. The story of, of McCall is a tragedy. Because it's a story about love that died. First Samuel 18, 20. Saul's daughter, Michal, had fallen in love with David. Okay, this is the beginning of the fairy tale. They fell in love. She said, I want that man more than any. There's a lot of fish in the sea. I want that one. Right? It's a love story. But the problem is she comes into this marriage with rejection issues. Her father's opinion her husband's mistakes, circumstance of life. So now this woman who fell in love, what does she do? She goes on the attack and she tears down the love that she had in the beginning. Proverbs 14, 1. It's not on there? Okay. I, wow, that would make three mistakes this year. That's not possible, so... I thought I made a mistake, but I was wrong. Okay, Proverbs 14, 1. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. So th think about that. You can tear down your own house. Or in this case, you can tear down love. This is what couples often, the conclusion they come to. We're not in love anymore. A as though that just happened. You woke up one morning. 
I don't love you. Like, it just, it just happened. No. What you've been doing is you've been attacking and recreating pain from the past. You've been failing to give the love that your spouse desperately needs. Is there anything? Okay, you just gave me a list of 150 things they do bad. Tell me, please, one thing they did good. You never say anything good. P partly that's destructive and partly that doesn't make common sense. If you know people, you don't motivate people by telling them how stupid and evil and bad they are. Ladies, listen to me. If you'll say something good to a man, he will work his butt off to try to give you more of the same. Anyway, that's another, another lesson. So people come and they say, we're not in love. But, but the real issue is, they strangled it to death. You didn't fall out of love, you murdered it. And the suspect list is very short in a marriage made up of two. <laughs> so, rejection kills love, rejection blocks blessing. David in this story is on the way, the Bible says, to bless his household. They were all to receive benefits. I'm using this now as a picture of God. What you need is the blessing of God in your marriage. David comes with a blessing and she stops him at the door. You pervert, you're making a fool of yourself. He doesn't force his way in. He does not get her in a headlock and say, I am going to bless you. Right? So the point is, you can't be blessed and bitter. There's a Bible principle, Matthew 18, 35. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Okay, there's a parable of a king who gives an incredible blessing. I want to forgive you. It's like you owed a hundred million dollars. Forget it. You don't have to pay back a cent. But then he won't forgive. And so he says, in prison with you, the blessing I wanted to give you, I will not because you can't hold on to rejection, you can't hold on to bitterness, and have the blessing of God. Mark 11, 24 and 25. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand, pray, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that the Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Okay, what you need in marriage is often a miracle. How can two selfish people have love? A miracle of God. How can people overcome the past? A miracle of God. And the Bible says you can pray for miracles, but the Bible says when you are praying for God to help you, but you're holding on to bitterness, resentment, rejection issues from the past, God says, I will not. So you stop the power of God. Final thought is rejection affects our fruit. Second Samuel 6, 23. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Okay, so the Bible says... This affects her. She had no children. This is not a physical condition. It's a curse. She cursed herself. So, I'm just applying this in two ways, of course. Spiritual fruitfulness. Some of you here, you want God to help you be fruitful. Be able to win souls. That's a, a Bible principle of fruitfulness. If you're holding on to bitterness and your rejection issues, fruitfulness is not going to flow well. That's a, that's a real possibility. Or we could apply it in a second way. People with rejection issues, the Bible calls your children your fruit. It's the fruit of your body. This is one of the tragedies of rejection. Some of you, we've been talking about all the different ways that you have been rejected, and many of you, you got it from your parents. Is that right? You grew up with dysfunction. Why did they act that way? Because they were rejected. And it's a curse, and you just pass it on and pass it on and pass it on. Why would you want your children that you love, why would you want them to go into marriage with the same pain that you took into yours? Why would you want to hurt them? Why would you want to affect all of their life in that way? All right, let's look. One final thought. Let's look at the good news for a minute. Ready for some good news? Okay, let's look at choosing a different ending. Many stories in the Bible are like this. They're a bummer. They're not fairy tales. There is no, and they all live happily ever after. For McCall, she never fixes her rejection issues. She never fixes her bitterness. That's a choice. It's not that you can't. It's that she wouldn't, and so she died barren. That is the bummer part of this. And why I'm teaching this is so 
That doesn't have to be your story. So, remember there's two people in marriage. Now there's David. David is a contrast. He's different than McCall in this way. Think about David. He was rejected. He was violated, just like McCall. He had his own pain, despised by his own father. The prophet comes and says, God has shown me that one of your sons is going to be chosen king. He doesn't even bother inviting David because there's, there's no way that guy could ever be king. Do you have any other sons? No. Oh, well, there's David. So I mean, that's how you were raised, right? You're an afterthought. Falsely accused by his brother, he tries to do something right. He's attacked by his brother. The king is ungrateful. He risks his life and the king doesn't appreciate it. Slandered, attacked, uh, plotted against by Paul, separated from his wife. So he had all of these painful rejection issues and yet... David did not turn out like McCall. This is the amazing thing to me as a pastor is I see people with the exact same circumstances. I was, I was raised with pain. This person was raised with pain. People treated me bad. This person, people treated me bad. I was violent. They were violent. But they are nothing alike. Totally. One person is like McCall. They become bitter and twisted and imprisoned. Another person, the same pain, makes them a better human being actually becomes the basis of future blessing in their life when they refer to past pain. And the reason why is David made different choices than McCall. See, what you do with rejection is a choice. You can't choose whether or not to be rejected. I promise you most, uh, probably every person, unless you're like three months old, you have been rejected in some way. You can't choose that. You can choose how you react to it. So think about David. He brought the violations of life to God. Read the Psalms. You read the book of Psalms, David will tell you about how people did him wrong. And he's, what, is, what are Psalms? They're prayers. He's praying, God, you see what they said. You see what they did. I don't know if I can make it. I need help. That's very wise. Some people think to be a Christian means that you always smile. There is nothing wrong because we're Christians. That's not what David did. He's like, God, I'm losing my mind. I don't think I'm going to make it. But he's talking to God about painful issues. And then that involves forgiveness. You cannot have a healthy present or future unless you get healed and let go of the past. Job 42.10. After Job had prayed for his friends... The Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Okay, Job, his friends, spend 30-something chapters of the Bible falsely accusing him, making his life even more miserable than it already is. And here it is. God says, Job, if you don't pray for them, I'm going to kill these guys. For some of you, you're like, okay. <laughs> and your point is... <laughs> He prayed for his friends. God, help them. That means I am letting go what happened to me. That takes a miracle, but God can do it if you're willing to let go. Second thing, David did different than McCall. He found his true value in God. This is the point. We've been looking at rejection. We'll do one whole lesson on this, but in every case, if you have received a message from anyone in life that you have no value, less value, you can only be healed if you find your true value, which is not self-esteem, is not looking in the mirror and going, I am somebody. It is only based on God's opinion. Let's look at two verses, Psalm 8, verse 4 and 5. But why are people even important to you? Why do you take care of human beings? You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Psalm 8 is a, a psalm of awe. He is going, God, why do you care about me? That is incredible. You made a little lower than the angel. You crown me with glory and honor. In other words, I honor his value or weight. God, I matter to you. It doesn't matter what somebody in the past said. Almighty God says something different. Psalm 139, verse 14. I praise you because you made me in an amazing and wonderful way. What you have done is wonderful. I know this very well. Okay. God, you made me and what you have done is wonderful. Some of you here, you are, you know, I, I use the illustration of ladies, they, they cannot receive, think anything good about themselves. 
Can I tell you, you don't have the right to do that? Because Almighty God said he made you in an amazing way. That's his opinion. That is something you have to find value in God. That needs to be a revelation because that then will help you. Probably there will be more people in life that may reject you. That's a possibility. The only protection against that is get rejection healed, find your value in God. Then it no longer matters. Why would I care what some random person thinks bad about me if Almighty God says I am fearfully and wonderfully made? He cared enough. He wants to have a relationship with me. That, that, is, that needs to be a revelation. Final thought is that David sought to be a blessing to others, and that's a whole lesson in itself probably we won't get to. But David, having been rejected, what does he want to do? Verses 18 through 20, he blessed the people. He wants to bless his household. And the call is, I am hurting, so I will attack and slash and kill everyone because of the way I feel inside. David is, I want to bless you. That's actually a healthy marriage. How can I bless you? How can I be? That's why I asked the question. Can you tell me something good about your spouse? And if you can, when is the last time you said it? Because it is when you bless. It heals you. It heals your relationships. I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. We're going to end a little early because of the marriage. I'm going to pray. There are people that are here. You need help. Some of you, you are not married, and maybe it is that what you have seen in marriage is, is keeping you. Others, you brought in rejection issues. You can see that. I'm going to pray that God's going to help you. God, there are people that are here. They need a miracle. Please open their eyes. This has to be more than words. God, those that have fear of marriage, please help them. I'm asking that you do a miracle of healing. God, there are people that are married here and they have gotten into a cycle of attack and recreating rejection. God, let that curse be broken. I am asking you, you are able to bring dead marriages back to life. You are able to restore love. And there are people, they need a miracle. God, there are people that are carrying pain from the past. Please, they need a miracle to be able to let it go. Heal their hearts and let it flow out in their marriage. Let it flow out in their children their ministry, their relationship with you. God, I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen.